Hello and welcome to the Kryptonaut Podcast. I am Mark Stores, and with me as always is... Rob Morphy. Hey, thank you all so very much for joining us this week. Oh, we got a whole intro we're supposed to do, and I totally flaked on it. <laughs> but I will say this, Robert. I will say this. Uh, recently, I've acquired a couple of things. Okay. One of them being an Apple Watch. Well, fancy pants. It screams at me, tells me to breathe. It also tells me I've completed all my steps, Wait, so it, I'm doing It tells you that. when to fucking breathe? I didn't know that was yes, something that machines needed to do now. Stress, Rob. A lot of stress. Gritting my teeth, not breathing, keeping it all in, <laughs> getting all that that's evil, the, dark oh. shit in my body built up. So. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> that, that's that's the perfect way to stay healthy for a real long time. Just bottle it up, yes. ignore yes. it, drink it away until it ruptures as a tumor. Thanks. Thanks, Exactly. Buddy. Now, to uh, to pair with my Apple Watch, I've also recently purchased a bidet. Um, oh, now that's good, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's changed my game completely. So I can sit on my toilet using my bidet with my watch. It's a goddamn awesome time. All right. You know, I'm envious because I haven't used a bidet since, you know, years ago, some time I spent in Europe. And I love it. I love the no work ass splash, the joy you get from that. It's just a phenomenal thing. But the the place I was staying in the Black Mountains in Germany had a toilet and next to it was a bidet. Now, I'm assuming you haven't installed a completely different apparatus, right? Oh, no. This is just like a little thing that it actually sits underneath my toilet seat. Uh, it's super easy. There's, it's obviously all like pressure driven with water it's got a hot it has hot water too so i can adjust the, the temperature on it yeah dude i'm treating myself nice oh my 2021, god 2021 mark's treating himself nice hell yeah so, so along with that too um i have received my first of my uh my first of my two uh covid vaccine uh shots excellent so, yep um no problem there sore arm i'm uh, apparently loaded up with uh with giraffe and banana dna I guess. Is that um, what's five, in the vaccinations? 5G. Yeah, who knows? There's <laughs> 5G. Everything's changing. Uh, I've been manipulated by the elites. And uh, and yeah, there. Oh, is. do not so, get me started. Good Lord. Yeah, when it. in all actuality, um, my arm was sore just for a little bit. It was no big deal. And uh, and yeah, um, you know, it's I was a little I think I was on the fence about it for a little while because it's kind of new and I'm young and healthy. So I'm like, I kind of hope this would go to somebody you know, maybe more older or, 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 vul- or vulnerable. Um, but I decided, you know, because of my work, I'm considered essential. So it's better to get it than not get it. Oh, hell yeah. And, and you're protecting uh, the people helps. you love too. Let's not, let's not yeah. think you're selfish here. You hang out with a lot of vulnerable motherfuckers and you are doing, you know, all of us a service by doing that. So don't think it's selfish. Yeah, it also breaks the stigma, too, because people are all weird about it and everything. And like I said, I, too, was, you know, a little bit hesitant. Yeah, I give no fucks, man. I've always trusted vaccinations. I hate that I was born after the the limit of smallpox. It had been pretty much cured. So I think I was the first generation not to get it. And I'm like, well, what the fuck? That could still be a biological agent used in an act of fucking, you know, non-sanctioned war, as long as you don't give fucks about the Geneva Convention. And I'm like, I would like, like, generations before me not to be able to get it, but you're in the same boat with me, buddy. I'm all about vaccinations. Yeah, there it is, man. We got we got uh, we got Apple Watches, bidets, COVID vaccines, Patreon. We got Patreon, Bobby, Patreon.com. we do. Slash Kryptonite Podcast at one dollar is a shout out. That five dollars is a shout out and some bonus audio. We got some shout outs to do. Mm-hmm. Let's do it, Robert. Let's begin with Gabe McDonald. MacDonald. Yeah, Let me make sure it's not the MC, it's the Mac. So proper uh Scottish MacDonald. Thank you, Gabe. Hell yeah, Gabe MacDonald. What up? Thank you so much. We're gonna go with Yak Yo. And I'm emphasizing ah. that because the exclamation point is there. Nice. What Thank you, Yak-yo? Yak-yo. Josh Pope, your holiness. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, Josh. Laura Paul. Oh, Laura, what up? Thank you so much. Kyo Mund. No, I said that wrong. I, I tried to add an N when there wasn't one. Kyo Muda, a.k.a. Noah. It's in parentheses. I don't know if that part was supposed to be the quiet part. If it is, Noah, I apologize. <laughs> but, uh, but it is Kyo Muda, Noah. Nice. Zeth K92. No, On your FM shit. dial. What up? Ghost Panda of Coal Creek. Hell yeah, Ghost Panda. B Rabbit. All the way from 8 Mile. What up, B Rabbit? Oh, no doubt. Christy Howard will round us out. 
Thank you all so very much for your monthly contributions. Fucking and don't forget right. that will get you access to the Discord. Be sure to check that out. Uh, real quick, we have a hellorspace.com merch announcement here. If you purchase any merch from us and there is something wrong with it, like let's say that you get a hoodie, this actually happened, and the print's stupid small on it, um, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and we will get you a replacement at no cost. So. Uh, if you're taking the, you know, if, if you're going to be putting your hard-earned money out there to get merch from us and our merch supplier screws that up, let me know. And oh, absolutely. Contact our guy. We'll take care of that because the last thing that we want is people getting merch that sucks. Oh, if you're so, paying for it, you deserve the best that can be provided hands down, period. I agree. Definitely. All right, cool. So this week we are going into outer space. Uh, I got this email from Rob earlier today. I did not think this was the story that we were doing, but this week... We are doing the Solute 7 Space Angels, Aliens, or Apocalyptic Apparitions. That is the question. If you're wondering where they come from, Rob has let us know. Uh, they come from outer motherfucking space. Yes, I like to. I, you know what? It's a throwback to our old American monster days where I always, in parentheticals, put the location, whether it's state, USA, or nation. And Because even though it was American monsters, obviously, we were dealing with global shit. So when I send these articles out to you and Chris, I always include place, even though it doesn't really come into play in the reading but it's a force of fucking habit and outer motherfucking space is indeed where the shit goes down in the summer of 1984 six highly trained cosmonauts claim to have had an unbelievable encounter with a group of gargantuan celestial beings of unknown origins in the infinite star-filled expanse above our world were these colossal entities the result of a mass delusion a sign of something miraculous or heralds of an unimaginable doom. Try to imagine the doom. You cannot. It's I unimaginable. Can't. It's, unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm like, there's doom, but I can't even think about it. No, it's, so, it's beyond the scope of doom. It is truly the unfathomable. It is indeed. All right, man. So we're going space celestial Oh, this is beings. great. This is taking this is us it. back to the heyday. The, I mean, we'll get into it. I'll get into we're going to get times and place. We're going to get, hopefully, the uh, the zeitgeist of the moment, you know, my favorite vocabulary word, and we're just going to fucking do this proper. <laughs> are we going to get, get a hubris and a denouement? We might even get gestalted. I might go oh, full no. German this pod. Oh, we don't know. No. God, all right. And all I do right, want to state for the record, in deference of uh, cold and flu season, I am drinking absolute screwdrivers with strawberry ice cubes. So, you know, I care about scurvy and being scurvy awareness season. Um, I'm not going to go on the high seas without fucking making sure I got my OJ in me. And for the record, it's also Mandarin absolute. So, you know, I really oh. give a fuck about myself. Awesome. Welcome, well, I'm world. glad that you're soaking yourself in fruit and alcohol. It's going to definitely solidify your inner core. Oh, absolutely. Um, into complete garbage. So cool. Oh, no. Yeah, awesome. no my, my guts Sweet. literally are going to be a Wapatula party at my funeral. Which will be in about three Excellent. weeks. Excellent. <laughs> Robert, bring us to space. Since the dawn of the atomic age, the threat of global annihilation has hung over the collective heads of the human race like a radioactive sword of Democles. Mercifully, the bitter rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union never manifested in the hellfire of nuclear holocaust that once seemed inevitable. But for those of us who remember all too well living under that horrific cloud of atomic anxiety, a very serious question remains. Did we manage to dodge this apocalyptic bullet by chance, luck, diplomacy, or was there some kind of otherworldly intervention at work in preserving the human race during some of the hottest days of the Cold War? I think that we've actually said this before, but didn't Chris's family, like, didn't they, like, pray this away? Yeah, no, yeah, I know. I w They did, right? This is so bad. I wish Chris was here right now so much because, yes, they saved America <laughs> single-handedly. <laughs> and he should, get the, he should be lauded for this. Yeah, No, no, I he mean, should. his mom and, and I suppose the, the priests that were feeding this information to her assured them that if every Friday, I think, they did not dedicate a massive amount of prayers to uh, delaying atomic Holocaust, it was going to fucking rain fire. And they did their well, part. And I say, yeah, thank just, you. I you mean, know, I'd say thank you too to the Carnicelli family. They worked hard regardless, you know, regardless of whether or not it really had any effect, they did the work and fucking a right. 
<laughs> We're here to did. talk about it. And I'm here to thank them. Continue, please. Hell yeah. The series of events that occurred on the Salyut 7 do not answer this question, but rather compel us to consider the possibility that there are other intelligences in this universe, be they divine or corporeal, who, in the most dire of times, manifest in ways that force us to question the very foundation of our beliefs, as well as our place in the cosmos. Much has been made of UFOs infiltrating both Russian and U.S. airspace and playing hell with both nations' arsenals of nuclear weapons, either by inexplicably shutting them down or, in even more horrifying incidents, initiating ballistic missile launch sequences that are mercifully cut short before global calamity could ensue. Another, less widely reported Cold War phenomenon occurred not down on the launch pad, but in the vacuum of space, where scores of UFOs have been spied by astronauts and cosmonauts since the earliest days of manned spaceflight. Gordon Cooper, Edgar Mitchell, Neil Armstrong, Jim McDivitt, and dozens of other NASA and Russian space explorers have no doubt that the Earth is being visited by non-human intelligences with access to technology far in advance of our own. They believe this because they've seen these devices with their own eyes. But as fascinating as this phenomenon surely is, the bulk of these sightings pale before a bizarre series of encounters allegedly reported by Russian cosmonauts aboard the Salyut 7. A little bit about this. The Salyut 7, which translates in English as Salute 7, was a low-Earth orbit space station launched on April 19, 1982. The station represented a foundational change in the Soviet space program's use of monolithic to more modular space stations. So instead of these just epic one-piece things, things that could be brought up incrementally like, you know, the International Space Station, and was the first and was first, excuse me, manned in May of 1982 with a crew of two. Man, that's a lonely crew, man. You just oh. got two of you sitting there, like me and you floating in space, me bitching about your phone. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, dude, hey, me and you above the uh, above the earth, me being listen, like, dude, your if, phone sucks. If <laughs> like, we could, if we could spend 14 hours at the Finger Lakes Mall fucking Mysticon, we can spend any amount of time in space together, buddy. And we <laughs> can right, make man, it better, I don't know, man. Because pirates might, won't I, be singing at his acapella regardless. I might if Frank Five from Town Steve Dave won't be showing up, but I might be wearing you as a spacesuit. We'll see. Oh, my God. <laughs> we'll see how Will it I be your out. tauntaun? You, and you thought I smelled bad on the outside, outside, fucker. Oh, man. There you oh, go. Oh, boy. He's wearing, wearing a big suit of Rob with an air hose in my mouth. Oh, like, my I'm God. Could you just imagine yeah. just pretending you're Rob flopping around all Ed Gein in me? Here you go. It, still, all, you're my, so my tiny, I'd be sucks. draping on you. I'd be like, oh, he's all lobes and weird. He doesn't even need his clothes. What is going on? <laughs> oh, but God. it's still probably oh. Rob. Oh, that's a great little, uh, that'd be a great little comic book right there. Robert no, Mark and Robin space. And I don't want you awesome. in me, you know, I mean, I, you know, within you're my body. I remove all, I remove all your insides. You're not all alive. Right. It's okay. I wear you as a suit. No, it, it's, said, no, listen, like it's not, it's listen, it's not about, it's not about having a man to man relationship with you. Hey, I'm open to options. If it saves lives, it's about fucking you wearing me like a fucking flesh suit. It just seems like the circumstances that were required with that would be so extreme that I just don't want to be a part of it. Well, yeah. I mean, we're guaranteed to make love, but I'll have to kill you. Oh, good enough. That's how it goes. All right. No, that's good. All right. No, perfect. No, like, like, Sounds good. I don't mind being a praying mantis lover. You know, I'll be the male. You be the female. <laughs> you bite me off. Get nourishment from my flesh. Wear my suit like a fucking my body like a suit. My suit like a body. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah. We're, fu- we're prime. Oh, uh, that. Yeah. This is no, going to go out in a- public. God damn, not been what a, is wrong with us? Not, not been a long week at all. All right, let's get back to Russian space. Let's do <sighs> this. The station was, according to official reports, designed to conduct scientific experiments, but in July of 1984, the Salyut 7 would serve as the site of arguably one of the strangest sightings ever reported in the then relatively brief history of space exploration. A sighting that was made all the more fascinating because it was not of strange crafts, but inexplicable entities. But first, just a little explanation of the atomic tightrope civilization was barely balanced on in the era in question. In 1984, 
sometime between the paranoia of Red Dawn and the triumph of Rocky IV, during what was the height of America's post-1950s second wave of Rambo-infused anti-communist jingonism, the citizens of the world, caught between these two atomic-powered brain behemoths, hung on every threat and counter-threat that was lobbed back and forth in the ever more bucolic interactions between Uncle Sam and the Red Menace. Not since the Cuban Missile Crisis had relations between these two superpowers been more strained. And, while Ronald Reagan doused the flames of potential Armageddon by going on a deficit-busting arms race spending spree, the world waited with bated breath to see if the planet would make it to the 21st century or if it was destined to become a scorched, cockroach-conquered husk hurtling through the endless black void of space. That's where you get Mad Max from right there, baby. Or Thunder the Barbarian. True. In the midst of all this cinematic propaganda and heated rhetoric, very few took note of the odd stories leaking through the cracks in the Iron Curtain regarding what a group of cosmonauts claimed to have witnessed aboard the Salyut 7 space station. Although the official chronicling of this event is fraught with chronological inconsistencies, as is often the case with information filtering out of authoritarian-ruled regions, by our best reckoning, the first reported sighting of the so-called celestial beings, quote-unquote, which would come to be known as space angels, occurred on July 12th, 1984. That's right before I turned 12. I was uh, four years old. You were a babins. Cosmonauts Leonid Kizim, Vladimir Solovyov, and cardiologist Dr. Oleg Atkoy were on their astonishing 155th day aboard the Salyut 7, conducting medical experiments, quote unquote, when the trio suddenly noticed what they described as a, quote, brilliant orange cloud, end quote, surrounding the station. Now you're in space. That's, that's some shit you're not necessarily expecting. You don't get yeah. fog in in even low Earth orbit. <laughs> no. No. I mean, I'm sure that they're probably sort of used to their surroundings, considering it's just an all-black void with yeah. stars. Little and, tiny you know. speckles of light, which are yeah, obviously maybe. little holes punctured through the curtain that God yeah. made. I mean, you know, according to my grandma. I mean, kind, kind of... <laughs> Yeah, the I'm master astronomer where... that she was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently. Grandma Morphy, <laughs> master astronomer. Uh, it was Grandma oh, O'Brien. Thank you. Come on. Oh, Deep sorry. Irish heritage. Oh, That's all geez. Right. All right. So you can kind of figure where the sun is. You can probably see the earth. You kind of got an idea. And all of a sudden, boom, where orange the thing. the sun is. That's what yeah. is. And, you know, I reckon the sun's about there. The earth's over yonder. I mean, you're going to be able to see it. It's not like it's not going to be there. You're going to definitely be able to see it. And then you're going to see the earth and this. And there's some orange clouds. And you're like, oh, let's get the cardiologist. Oleg, he knows what's up. Dude, you just then, passed you Elon go. Musk's test. You can go into space now. You figured I, dude, out I've the been geography ready for... of space. You know it. I've been ready for Space Force now since it was announced, but oh, nobody God. wants to take me up on it. So I think I would do I mean, good in space. I'm so happy it exists, and yet at the same time, there can be nothing good that will come of it. No. That's a discussion for maybe later, but God damn it. It worries me and delights me. It delights the sci-fi kid in me and the adult that doesn't need anything in space that can plummet down and destroy things or do any fucking shady shit. Loathes it. But I digress. I need guns. I need guns in space, Rob. Dude, Give it to me. The rumor is aliens won't let that happen. Anytime we've well, tried to bring nuclear armaments in space, that shit has been kiboshed. On it's the not quick. nuclear. It's lasers. We're the fucking United States of America. Fuck Atomic you powered lasers. Nuclear, yeah, buddy. Exactly. Just saying. Uh, balls. Whatever. We'll figure out new technology. Balls, anyway, medical experiments. Brilliant orange cloud. Love it. Fearing that the glow might be emanating from a life-threatening fire, totally legitimate concern. The men totally. rushed to the portholes only to find themselves blinded by an eerily intense luminescence. After their vision adjusted to the light, the curious cosmonauts radioed ground control that the station was bathed in an anomalous, seemingly self-illuminated mist. The men returned to the portholes, shielding their eyes from the radiance, and that's when they spied something so incredible that it would forever alter their perception of reality. Hmm. According to the reports published in newspapers across the globe, including the Washington Post, the three Russian explorers saw a group of colossal, winged, humanoid entities hovering just outside of the station in the vacuum of space. 
they shouldn't be there. No, 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 no. That's not, not a common all. sight. Another no. random spy satellite or Ted Turner's latest fucking cable which of magizit. <laughs> sure. A <laughs> random go Ted Turner's rocket satellite. that's just hovering around being all fuck all and trying to fuck shit up. Fine. Yeah. The moon, yeah. the sun, the earth, the shit you expect to see. You already passed the test. But um I did, I'm there. Super giant kaiju um angels. Yeah, weird. Less okay. So. And they're in they're in the vacuum of space, so clearly um, you know, pressure doesn't matter to them so all right or cool. we're on yeah we're on level playing ground here i love it the faces of these beings were said to resemble those of humans with quote peaceful expressions end quote and the soviet scientists even claimed that the creatures noticed them and offered distinctly beatific smiles that's not good well maybe i mean sure see all right here's the thing when you hear of a beatific smile, it's like this. It's not condescending. It's like a gentle glowing. I'm better than you, but guess what? I still, I still love you and I want you to be okay. But boy, that does seem like it's foreshadowing for the other boot, doesn't it? Like, yeah, the, like, uh, oh, the, and then, and, and the then all of a sudden the music fucking changes and shit's on. Yeah. If you remember Attack on Titan, the, the Titans all had beatific smiles. They, they really did. You. Oh man, they you did, just fucking yeah. nailed it. Exactly. And who would have thought they're going to be eating people in half with their crazy stumpy legs and lack of genitals. They're actually horrifying. I love that cartoon as everyone does who sees it because it's magnificent. But if I had seen that as a kid, I would have loved it and yet loathed it at the same time. Now you got these giant space angels smiling at you. Specifically, which I like. The following statement, so I'm about to give you a quote here, was published in one of the later newspaper reports, although I could not discern which cosmonaut it is accredited to, and it goes as such, quote, what we saw were seven giant figures in the form of humans, but with wings and mist-like halos, as in the classic depiction of angels, end quote. (sighs) I almost wonder if for a second they were like, Ah, shit, we went too far. We went to heaven. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, could you imagine, like, oh, could you imagine, like did we this shit just blow up far. and we didn't know? Did fucking, <laughs> yeah. is Salyut 7 gone? Is this, the, is this the transition? No, or they actually they actually went too far out of orbit or whatever, <laughs> and they just made it to, the, to <laughs> heaven. They're like, oh, damn it. flying to heaven? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you <laughs> like, seven? Quick. What the fuck, yeah. dude? Call Yuri, bring us back. Oh, We've gone too far. We're gone. Yeah, dear, we took yeah, a dear lap Yuri. And we went to heaven. <laughs> yeah, dear Yuri, we're in heaven and we're not supposed to be here. This sucks. All right. All right. Well. That's a great title. Dear Yuri, we're in heaven. We're not supposed to be here. This sucks. If I do go. not ghostwrite this for you, I will not have a complete <laughs> life. Period. <laughs> awesome all right well that's i mean again seven giant things not what you want to see in no space. all right well let's, let's especially see what, seven let's but see we'll what, discuss that in a moment let's see where this takes us. the cosmonauts went on to describe these mist haloed beings as being nearly 80 fucking feet in height with a wingspan that they agreed was comparable to that of a 747 jet okay the men observed the angelic beings for approximately 10 minutes before they abruptly vanished, leaving the isolated and no doubt perplexed comrades to ponder what it was that they had actually, that they had actually seen and to gather the courage to report it to their superiors below. And that could not have been easy. That'd be hard if you're working for NASA in a relatively free country because fuck. But when you're, you know, it's still the Soviet Union and it, and 84 Maybe in the inner Kremlin, there was a sense that shit was about to crack. But as far as the world at large was thinking, that was a monolithic entity that would be there, you know, fucking threatening the world forever. Yeah, that's that report can't be easy to write. No. Like, all right, well, where do we start? <laughs> so Yuri screwed us up, we went into space, and now <laughs> we're in heaven. So great. By their own admission, the cosmonauts were reluctant to accept the reality of these evidently angelic entities, and they concluded that they must have suffered from some form of group delusion brought on by their prolonged tenure in orbit. They also had no desire to have themselves labeled either incompetent or mad by letting the world know that they had bore witness to massive winged humanoids, be they angel or alien, who were evidently able to endure, without benefit of a protective suit, the frigid, radiation-filled vacuum of space. Despite their best efforts, the cosmonauts 
self-induced denial would be put to the test a mere 11 days later when additional cosmonauts arrived at the station. And with them, yet another visit from these ethereal titans. On the evening of July 17th, 1984, at exactly 5.41 p.m., the Soyuz T-12 spacecraft launched from the LC-31 pad of the Bacchanor Cosmodrome, I love the word Cosmodrome, which is located in the isolated backwaters of Kazakhstan, approximately 124 miles east of the Aral Sea. Hours later, the craft docked with the Salyut 7. The Soyuz T-12 carried with it a crew of three, including crew commander, and rest assured, I will massacre these names, Vladimir Dzahani Bekov, Dzahani Bekov, flight engineer Svetlana Savitskaya, and research cosmonaut Igor Volk. The mission had been hastily thrown together just a month following an announcement made by NASA in November of 1983, stating that astronaut Catherine D. Sullivan would become the first woman to ever perform a spacewalk. The trio of cosmonauts had been tasked with a simple mission. Beat the Americans to the punch and make sure that Savitskaya became the first woman to execute a spacewalk. What the fuck are we doing as Americans announcing this shit? You, you put this well, lovely, industrious, hardworking scientist up there, and you let her do it, and then you announce later that you won. Dumb. Well, but you, you you have to make the announcement of we're doing this shit, but make it when when she's like getting off the the, the lander. Exactly. You know, like wait until she's like almost there, and then you're like go. And she's got like, and like you know, three inches to go before she steps out the portal, and you're like, yeah. America. Because then you've got the Russians. The Russians are racing up there, but no one knows the Chinese already built a base on the other side of the moon, so they don't fucking care because they're like, we already beat you guys here. In all fairness, the Nazis built one there first in the late 30s with the help of the reptilians. We'll we'll do that one someday. But we <sighs> ended up well, earning it after Operation pa- Paperclip, so it's ours hopefully now. Someone, hopefully someone bombed those Nazi moon fucks into oh, yeah, no, non-existence. No, moon so. Nazis are a fucking thing of the past, buddy. That's no fucking worse. over. That dream is all done. Right. Fuck them. Good. All right. Good riddance. <laughs> I think everyone agrees. Fuck space Nazis. Exactly. Fuck Nazis in general, but double fuck space Nazis. True Taking that. your shit to the cosmos. Get out of here. <laughs> Savitskaya had already ascended into the ranks of Soviet sanctioned idols in 1982 when she became the second woman to ever officially go into space. Although there remains speculation that she was actually the third and that the first perished in orbit. Eh, maybe a story for another they, day. They, they they just hid the third, the, the second one, really? They're like, oh, she died. Don't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no, I wrote, I wrote an article about it once where people, a lot of people with the, you know, the, what do they call them? Ham radio, free range radios. I don't know where they have their own fucking systems. <laughs> it's free range right. radio. I'm sure that's the <laughs> yeah, right free- Free range radio. Yeah, you know, <laughs> for all you ham operators out there, free I range apologize. <laughs> so, like it, these Italian brothers and other people picked up what they thought was a Russian. It was a Russian voice. Um, it was a woman's voice, and it was somebody unfortunately dying and seemed to be I, maybe in a fire. Yes, I remember this, and it's it's terrifying. It's, all it's right, a well, horror show. So, some people speculate right. that she was the first woman into space, though she never came home, so that shit was covered up. Maybe or maybe not. The powers that be of the Soviet space program wanted very much to post yet another victory in their space race against the U.S. So that's why um, Svetlana was sent up there to do this. And and let's be honest, um, the space race was great in a way, even though it was a little before all of our times. I mean, I think I was born in the ass end of it, barely, but it really drove... Two very powerful, very industrial, very academically inclined nations to really go for bigger and better things. And in a nonviolent way, that's the beautiful part about the space race. It was just about uh, outdoing the other, but not necessarily in a way that hurt the opposite, which is the way you like it. And, And a lot of progress was made, but they beat our ass at every single turn. First satellite, Sputnik, uh, the first, first man, I, you know, Yuri fucking the first, everything, first dog, first monkey, first fucking every. And then we got them to the moon, which was the big one. That was the big one. And that technically kind of ended the space race and it petered out. And so it just became space shuttles going up to put up fucking, you know, 
super cable satellites and, and clandestine military shit, which is great. And, and I fully admire like story Musgrave and all the other astronauts that were doing it throughout the eighties and beyond. And they still were great men and women who deserve all our respect, but really the thrill of great space exploration sort of died in the early seventies with the end of the Apollo program. Well, I mean, thankfully we got Elon Musk, man. You know, he's no, just know. pushing up. Uh, he's pushing up GameStop on Twitter, and he's launching cars into space. So oh God my bless God! Him. Yeah, he's, he's doing, a, and he's the richest man in the fucking known universe right now. He's and a tr- uh, he's a true saint. He's a true saint. It, you know, if he keeps up the space program, if he gets if he gets feet on Mars, I will be truly impressed. But that well, having been said, um, we'll see that one. The day. Russians, the Soviets, technically kicked balls, kicked our balls all over the place until the very end. And this is just yet another one where they just threw it up there. Just another fucking mark, which, you know, made the guys at NASA, even though at that point they probably didn't have crew cuts and little like short sleeve white button up shirts and big cigars. Like, first off, it must have been a fucking uh, a cancer fucking oxygen tent in fucking, you know, the control room at NASA back in the sixties. <laughs> There's uh, all those computers are stained yellow. Oh yeah. God. It's yeah. gross. <laughs> it's real gross. All right. <laughs> all right. Much to the chagrin of NASA, the Soviets made good on their plan to upstage the U S when on July 25th, 1984, Savitskaya engaged in an almost four hour EVA extra vehicular activity. That is session officially making her the first woman ever to do so. As auspicious as this occasion was in the annals of human space exploration, in the long run, it would not be this undeniably incredible accomplishment that the journey would be known for, as it was upstaged by a much more ethereal series of events. According to published reports, just days after the Soviet cosmonauts were safely nestled aboard the Salyut 7, the strange orange glow once again enveloped the station. And this time, all six of the space travelers were said to have witnessed these gigantic, winged, celestial beings keeping pace with the station, which they once again dutifully reported to an ever more alarmed ground control team. The six cosmonauts stared out of the portals, overwhelmed by sensations of awe, wonder, and just a touch of fear. After all, these men and women were highly trained pilots, scientists, and doctors from an atheistic nation state who, after years of understanding their place in the evolutionary hierarchy, were now confronted with extraordinary, massive humanoid beings soaring unprotected in the vacuum of space. Creatures that seemed less like aliens, which would have been difficult enough to accept, frankly, and more akin to the Elysian entities of supernatural origin that were written about in the Bible and other ancient texts. According to a news account at the time, one of the, again unnamed, unfortunately, cosmonauts was quoted as saying, quote, They were glowing and we were truly overwhelmed. There was a great orange light, and through it we could see the figures of seven angels. They were smiling as though they shared a glorious secret. But within minutes, they were gone, and we never saw them again. Ah, the glorious secret portrayed by the smile of enormous 80-foot-tall seven angels. I know! Awesome. And you're stuck in a little (laughs) tiny spaceship. And you're just watching this. What do you do with that? Like, how does your life go back to normal? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess the, the the only thing you can really do is put something over the portholes and be like, we're not going to even accept this. We're just going to continue with our mission and That's hopefully exactly these it. fucking things go away. You know, if you're a solid Soviet hide. cosmonaut citizen, you're going to be like, just hide. Fuck that shit. Lenin did not want angels in his protocols and fucking, <laughs> yeah, and we really. don't either. And this is some bullshit. Uh, it's obviously right. uh, capitalistic holograms trying to dissuade us from the glory of, uh, of shared economy, hail Marx. <laughs> yeah, the the capitalist hologram strike again. God, God damn, damn them! What are you do? All right. Okay. After the space angels disappeared the second time, Kizim, Solovyov, and At At Koy Atkov. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Could no longer dismiss the phenomenon as a shared hallucination brought on by the pressure of a long mission in space. They now shared this encounter with three new witnesses, all of whom were presumably just as perplexed and frightened as the first set of cosmonauts were days earlier. 
This left both the explorers and the crew at Mission Control to ponder the question, what exactly did these cosmonauts see? Just imagine being like at Mission Control, oh. and they report back with what they see, and you're like, oh, shit, who's going to tell Yuri? Yeah, who's going to tell Yuri? I know, it's always who's Yuri. Who's going to tell Yuri? Who's going to tell? Oh, oh God damn, damn it. it. Yeah, and you're oh. just hoping the higher-ups don't, you know, you're just hoping maybe you can kind of squash a little bit and just be like, all right, we're going to let people know, but maybe not like right away. We're just going to kind of see what happens. So, yeah, that's uh, that's stress. As long, um, space isn't stressful enough. All of a sudden, it's, you've got these giant angels. Exactly. So. And then you've got to report right. it to the fucking, you know, Yuri Sanofovich and his fucking crew. Yeah, and you got to And then oh, they got to tell the Yuri fucking Sinofovich. premier and the fucking yeah. the cabinet. I don't even I I don't even remember the names. We of don't all understand how communist government. I used work, to remember so. what was I don't know the group around. Uh, you know what? We're never going to be able to. They don't need it out. fucking angels. Wrong. No, they don't. All right. Well, let's let's see where their journey takes them. Let's. Not long after, Dzani Bakov, Savitskaya, and Volk returned to Earth via the Soyuz T-12, while Kizim, Solovyov, and Atkov remained in orbit in the Salyut 7 for a record 237 days. Oh, you know when they left, they were like, good luck with the angels! And they yeah, just fuck fucking up. jumped in their ship and they fucking bailed. So, uh, and you wonder if like the International Space Station has ever had moments like this. You really do. Well, we'll never know. Well, well, we will know if it happened. If it happened, somebody eventually is going to say it. But nobody astronauts, wants to be the first. Listen, astronauts keep their secrets. You you know this for a fact? I do. Have you ever met an astronaut? Maybe. You've not. <laughs> I made you think. Ha ha, gotcha. Ha! I've met one astronaut, and that motherfucker did not seem to be keeping any secrets. But then again, I wasn't asking oh, okay. anything illicit. And all right, well, let's not get into that story. He was awesome. <laughs> so, and I'll leave it at right, that. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. Upon their return, each of the cosmonauts were subjected to an intense battery of physical and psychiatric examinations to try to see if there might be a medical or psychological explanation for this potentially heavenly phenomenon. But according to all accounts, they passed both with flying colors. So no beef with their heads, no beef with their bodies. They just saw some shit. No, they're all intact. If one is willing to believe the testimony as it's been presented, then the medical diagnosis leaves only one of two viable conclusions. The first is that six cosmonauts in two separate instances were willing to seriously jeopardize their careers, reputations, potentially their very lives, not to mention open a Pandora's box of questions regarding their psychological well-being, all for the sake of a prank. Weird prank. Yeah. No gain. No one's going to laugh. Yeah. They're just going to lose their jobs and be shot. No gain. So, all pain. Yep. The oh, second, there you go. Yeah, there it is. The second conclusion is, quite simply, that they saw, quote unquote, angels, or at the very least, anomalous astronautic entities that bear a very distinct resemblance to what many followers of the Abrahamic traditions would consider to be divine messengers. Of course, there are more than a few who stand firmly by the proposition that these otherwise level-headed men and women fall pre fell prey to nothing more than a mass hallucination. The evidence for mass hallucinations is dubious at best. While episodes of mass hysteria have been chronicled throughout the ages, most of which having to do with perceived physical ailments or observations that extend over somewhat substantial periods of time, there is very little to suggest that individuals are privy to simultaneous and shared hallucinations. That's just not a phenomenon. Like three people that happen to be hanging out in a fucking Denny's booth, if there are any left, are not going to probably see the same Marian apparition unless there's some shit going on with the toaster. Right. Trying to get everyone on the same page. Yeah. It's not really something that you can easily do. And again, when your reputations are at stake, when you're hardcore professionals, when you're men and women of science, there's no boon to that. That's all yeah. downside. Exactly. While there have been reports of individual cosmonauts and astronauts who have seen some decidedly surreal things from within their spacecrafts, a phenomenon which NASA researchers have attributed to pressure, temperature fluctuations, and oxygen shortage, 
there's nothing in the medical record to suggest that these experiences are in any way contagious. You just can't catch someone else's thought unless you're, I know, fucking full of ESP. Yeah, that that's fair. The only thing that I would bring up with that is as far as oxygen shortage, if there is for some reason, um, well, if you're talking about pressure, temperature fluctuation, and oxygen shortages, those are all things environmentally that everybody would be experiencing. But, but to have the same visual hallucination exactly. because of that, I mean, unless your eyes are all closing at the very same time and because there's no oxygen <laughs> and you're cold or you're too hot and then all of a sudden you're getting a weird glare off your helmet, but we'll we'll save that for, for the end. Yeah, so, yeah no doubt. Spe- spe- that, that's my skeptic hat, my boots. My, the glare my on the helmet? Gloves. Yeah. Yep. Yuri's trying to fucking impress Ivan. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah no, I saw an angel too. Yeah, well, right. In short. Barring some kind of heretofore undiagnosed psychic phenomenon, there are simply no known ways to share a delusion as specific as the one the cosmonauts of the Salyut 7 are believed to have succumbed to. Period. That's just a fact. The current psychological certainty that hallucinations are not infectious, combined with the fact that we are dealing with a group of scientists and seasoned space explorers who, by necessity, are not prone to panic or flights of fancy, makes it all but inconceivable that mass hallucination is the culprit in this case. So, If for the sake of argument, we agree that we're not dealing with what is tantamount to a figment of the cosmonauts' collective imaginations, then we've got to at least consider the possibility that we may be contending with authentic entities of either biological, energetic, or spiritual origin. Oh, space Jesus is coming for you, baby. It's the best Jesus. messengers. There's... There's, well, baby Jesus is always the best. He's just fucking adorable and sage. Dude, if you have, uh, look, if you got baby Jesus with the giant robot Gundam hands, oh. that's the best Jesus ever. Yeah. But then space that, Jesus is a wicked close second. This could be a whole Mormon thing. And then, so let's and not then petulant that out, out there, uh, yeah. Gnostic Jesus who likes to fucking kill you and resurrect you. And then you're cool yep. with it because, you know, you feel a little totally. better than you did in the morning anyway. That That's probably third for me. It's a per- cool. You know what? The Jesus you love is a personal thing. For me, it's baby it space and fucking petulant teen, but it could be whatever you want. Yeah, it's your choice. He's your savior. <laughs> Perhaps we should cut to the chase and consider the most obvious and in some ways most disturbing option. That these creatures are angels that might just be heralds of the apocalypse. Ah, oh, they're like the four horsemen, but they're the seven horsemen. <laughs> Seven horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, I know, and again, this is where, oh, God God bless you, Chris, recover quick, because as a, a, a fellow former Catholic who was raised in parochial schools, you would understand that seven is much more significant than you think. The four horsemen are the I know that I know the number seven is definitely, biblically speaking, significant, but... Let me, let me do this. All right. I know that for some, it might seem like a stretch jumping from what most people would consider to be a benignly heartwarming encounter with angelic giants to the end of the world as we know it. But as a former altar boy and parochial school student, there is one thing I know all too well, and that is when seven angels show up, trouble is not far behind. If they're playing trumpets, you're fucked. Yeah. Anyone yeah, familiar you're, you're with Jewish or Christian traditions is probably aware of the fact that the number seven is considered by many to be a sacred number, which represents rectitude and sanctity. The number is also one that plays a significant role in the so-called end of days. The concept of seven archangels is found in the early works of Jewish uh, religious literature and in modern Christian teachings, their names are, there's different names and, and different, and, you know, versions of it. But what we're familiar with is in the Christian world are Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael, Selafiel, Raguel, and Barachiel. The children I hope you bear to me someday, Mark. I mean, those are like the worst Ninja Turtles ever. Like, they're like total dollar store knockoff. Oh, like, yeah. Okay, here's Uriel, and you're like, oh, he's got a pink bandana. or whatever. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The I think the girl turtle had a pink bandana at one point in the TV series. But yeah. I, I didn't even remember there was uh, a girl turtle. Well, Yeah, that was in the TV series. I never went yeah, deep um, in the lore, I'll be honest. 
Ah, uh, you're you're missing out, man. It's a it's an it's a it's an excellent universe. Everyone should be checking it out. Uh yeah, Gabriel actually was my favorite of them all. Really? Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Solid dude. There to get the fucking job done. Doesn't fuck around. Hardcore guy. Loves his family. Heart of gold. <laughs> I didn't yep. realize how right. deep you were, man. There you go. Book of Revelations, babe. It's my favorite book. Oh, snap. According to the Bible's book of Revelations, in order to herald the apocalypse, these seven angels, as you just mentioned, first have to blow seven trumpets, after which they, I shit you the fuck not, pour seven bowls filled with God's holy wrath onto both, and I quote, the wicked and the followers of the Antichrist. Were you familiar with the plague bowls? I was, yes, yes. No, they they fill them with God's wrath. I'm not sure what kind of liquid that is, and then they dump them on everybody. You know, we're gonna <laughs> so, we're gonna take a moment. Like, I know it's stepping. I know we're stepping away from the the Russian okay. space station of import okay. and the angels. Let's just All deal right. with the bulls. The first bull okay. is loathsome sores. Oh, awesome! My favorite bull, delicious. No, My no Ponderosa do favorite. It. Like it's not like okay. sore sores or no, ugly. Nope. It's loathsome. I love that. I love it. Ponderosa, the second baby. bowl turns the seas to blood. Yeah, that, that one's dope too. Red seas, hell yeah. Do you know how this this shows you how thorough a hateful end of the world God is? The third bowl turns the waters to blood. That includes the rivers and springs, which are already rat filled, as we know. Yep. The fourth bowl is poured out, and the sun causes a major <laughs> heat wave to scorch the planet. Good. It's about time. I'm, 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 dude, it's upstate New York. I'm here freezing. Uh-huh. I need some heat. Help me out, God. When the fifth bowl is poured out, a thick darkness overwhelms the kingdom of the beast. Just saying. Sixth okay. bowl, the great river Euphrates dries up so that the kings of the east might cross to be prepared to battle. Three unclean spirits with the appearance of frogs come, one each, out of the mouths of a dragon, the beast, the false prophet. These demonic spirits work satanic miracles to gather minions of the world against the forces of good during the Battle of Armageddon. So what I love about this is that three frogs shit out of the mouth of a dragon, and people are willing to say, you know what? I might follow these guys in the battle. Yeah, why not? They are good public speakers. Yeah, they're probably pretty big too. It's probably the size of like Savage Dragon. I'm, you know, if one of them has a Roman candle and any of them have parachute pants, I think we know the yeah. deal. Loveland Frogs, baby, Heralds of the Apocalypse. Seventh Bowl. A global earthquake causes cities of the world to collapse. All the mountains and islands are removed from their fucking foundations. Giant hailstones weighing approximately 100 fuck sucking pounds each will plummet onto the planet. So. Like cool. I'm bored, says Ming the Merciless, because that's clearly what's <laughs> yeah, happening here. Exactly. I just, exactly. I, ever All since right. I was a kid, part of me was like, I was scared because, you know, you're always scared when people tell you there's evil monsters and you watch The Exorcist and, you know, you're scared of that. You see scary movies. And when you're young enough, you just actually associate that with what adults are telling you is the real world until, you know, right. you're, if you're lucky enough, you grow up. But fucking, uh, but but to me, this has just always been absurd. The bowls of doom. Not, you know, not goblets, <laughs> not Dude. something cool, not like the pitcher of the abyss, but just these fucking bowls of plague. Just yeah. Shitting all over. Anyway, I just felt like when I needed you're to at, share that. Listen, when you're at the last Ponderosa, not <laughs> located near us anymore, yeah, they have the, the seven bowls of doom. I mean, that's just, it's it's a part of it. I was at, I was at a... A Ponderosa, sadly, it closed down due to COVID, RIP, uh, taking a hit. Yeah, but they're uh, like, horrible. Like, like a year ago. They were I was always there like a year ago. They were the worst food I, dude, ever. I the ate seven there so much. Bowls, the seven bowls of doom were the best. No, I cool. agree. I agree. It was dope. You can get at least three of them at Red Lobster. So, you know, I mean, it's not like they're gone completely. Okay. All right. I'm going to take your word for it, but I don't know. RIP Pondo. Is it possible? that seven angels appeared before these emissaries of the USSR as a warning of what would come if both they and the USA did not tone down their heated rhetoric before the Cold War turned thermonuclear hot. Or, even more grimly, was it a sign that it was already too late and that the events had been sent into motion that could not be undone? Events 
that may still be unfolding to this very day. While I must admit, I am not convinced that the book of Revelations is anything more than a metaphorical warning for sinners to mend their ways before it is too late, if there's even a chance that it is the simple truth, then I hope the former option is the correct one, and that the angels were showing themselves in an attempt to avert rather than proclaim global disaster. And for those who might suggest that these peacefully smiling angels could not possibly have nefarious intentions, I would only state that, according to scripture, the purpose of the apocalypse is not to cause evil, but to eliminate it from the earth. And what angel would not be happy about that? That's something that's explored Fair. a lot in fiction. Okay. And, 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 you know, yeah. it does worry me because think about angels in a biblical context. I know you probably don't a lot, but I had the opportunity to when I was <laughs> yeah, young. I don't. I really They don't. are the acolytes of God. They are considered lesser than men, even though their powers are infinitely grander. And, and at least right. according to medieval art, they have sweet wings and stuff. But really, they are basically slave drones to God. And then God decided to create something in his own image, something that was worth saving, something that, even though it goes beyond my uh, ability to wrap my head around, something he was willing to create a son uh, out of his own flesh and the flesh of a woman and fucking murder for the sake of saving. So whether or not I'm comfortable with that whole scenario, at least you know he's fully dedicated to us. Angels, not so much. In fact, so much so were they ignored that Lucifer and, and his minions were like, Fuck you, dude. We were here first. We're awesome. We've been dedicated to you since day one, and you fucking love these shit bags. Eat it. And then, of course, they get cast down into the pit, and they do their fucking thing. So when you look at it in that context, these kindly smiles might be very much for the fact that they're purging evil from the earth. They don't sense maybe... Um, the value we put on our own lives, even if we are perpetual beings. And I would like to think the energy, the essence that is us, whether it is the consciousness or if you want to call it the soul, I'd like to believe. And I really do think it does maintain and continues in different forms throughout. I don't know the universe as it is, but, but these things would not necessarily be sad about massive, fiery, horrific flesh death. If what God designates is that the flesh has to die for the righteous to go right. to heaven and the corrupt to go fucking south of heaven, as Slayer would say. So, the, the, you know, their beatific smiles. I, I don't think, you know, it's not like fucking Michael Landon in Highway to Heaven. Angels are not these like sweet guardian <laughs> conscious things. They're almost like automatons that if they're still dedicated to God, they're following the fucking rule. They're bureaucrats. They're hardcore about doing what God said you do and fuck, don't fuck around and, and, and being happy about God's will being done. Even if it is say, Oh, drowning humanity in Noah's time. Um, it's almost like the fallen ones as much as demons are shady. And that's why I think much like Lilith has become a feminist icon, Satan has become a sort of rebellious free thinkers icon in the sense that this dude's like, listen, we loved you most and you don't even give fudges about us. Screw it. And, he, and, and then God unceremoniously chucks him out. Now, I can understand where Christians would say it's pure evil. Don't get seduced by this stuff. But I could also understand where free thinkers are like, yeah, these dudes, you know, are just trying to think for themselves. And when the snake gave you the apple and let you be self-aware. Was that a curse? I mean, yeah, you got to live in the paradise of Eden and have all the food you want and snuggle with fucking fawns and do whatever the fuck you wanted to do. But after that, you got to, I don't know, you know, learn how to make fire and enjoy a good fuck and do all these things that weren't on the table before. So I, I guess I, when you go from a literalist biblical view, a happy angel is not necessarily a comfort to me. Yeah, I think uh God chose us and uh he chose wrong. So, you know, I mean, follow me on Twitter at Mark Stores. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so yeah, God, God, God chose us and he chose, he chose me That'll over be the angels. Follow -up book. <laughs> That'll be go. the follow-up book after the yeah. first one. Um yep. maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I mean, that's part of you know the humankind's arrogance, especially well, let's be honest, mankind in the sense of men's arrogance, and that you have dominion over the earth. So Fuck your resources and screw all the animals and ruin everything because God says it's cool. I put it all here for you. Fuck it. You're special. You're built like me. I mean, you don't have my omnipotence or my ever and never ending mercy or, oh, my ability to drown the earth. But, you know, you, you think for yourself and you're pretty cool and 
you know, you're my babies. I, I like you. It's a yeah. weird well, relationship and angels really fit in a, you know, I mean that movie prophecy with Christopher Walken for all its failings oh. and it's stuck at it like a truck stop. The idea of an angel being resentful of God's adoration right. of this. It's almost like you love your second kid so much more than your first kid and your first kid has to live with it. Like that's not awesome. That would be a shitty way to live. I can imagine. I mean, yeah. I didn't have to live that. I yeah. don't know, but fucking for someone that, that, has to live like that that's a horrible thing for a parent to do let us not forget prophecy too with a cameo by none other than mr glenn dancer oh my i never saw that he was uh yeah he had like he had like one line and then he was killed but whatever anyway and while we're at it uh, just for the record let's not forget the original prophecy which was about mercury uh and the lumberjack water that made an inside out bear that threw a kid in a sleeping bag against a tree where he exploded in blood and feathers 70s nature run amok <laughs> classic that has nothing to do <laughs> with this excellent excellent all right sweet so bringing okay. it back to the russians what do we got conspiracy theories have circulated for years concerning the hubble telescope snapping angelic images in the ngc 3532 star cluster that have been shared with only the highest echelons of the u.s soviet and french governments as well as pope john paul ii in the Vatican when he was still the reigning Pope who had speculated that these quote unquote beings of light might not be heaven sent. So the fucking devil. That's yes, funny. I knew it. And you know, what's even weirder. Yes. This happens a lot in UFO lore. And a lot of our listeners that are, you know, that's their bag. Um, will understand this. A lot of the weird clandestine things seem to be between the supposed enemies of the U S and the Soviet union and the fucking French. Not the British and our, you know, special friendship, which in real life, it's fucking phenomenal and, and it's awesome. And I, you know, I love that it's part of my heritage and it's part of our, our allyship. But with clandestine matters, it always seems to be the U.S., the French, and the Russians. I find that huh. just odd. So it's like the U.S., the French, and the Russians versus the devil? Uh, or not. I mean, maybe we're okay, on the devil's right, side. Well, whatever. But I, I find it interesting, yeah. though it's completely hearsay, that Pope John okay. Paul was like, let's not get suckered in you know I, right. i'm talking about the beatific smiles might not necessarily bode well for us that want to remain corporeal but they might actually right. be demons in disguise bizzle that means oh, disguise yeah in, in the 90s demons. parlance i, I tried to uh say disguise <laughs> I love a space demon. All right, cool. According to these reports, the spectacular photos are allegedly being kept under wraps due to the fact that the knowledge of the angel's existence may well send the citizens of Earth into a global tizzy, or so these rumors claim. Another fact which bears scrutiny is a news report regarding Vladimir Solovyov's tour of a British school which appeared in the Derby Evening Telegraph on January 23rd, 1997. While visiting the Brackensdale Junior School, Solovyov was asked about whether or not he had encountered any alien beings. Here's an excerpt from the Telegraph's article, and I quote, If you believe the Washington Post, Mr. Sol Solovyov has already come face to face with beings from another planet and seven angels who surrounded his craft on a mission in 1984. He added, I could not believe they put that in such a serious paper. I have never seen an alien, but I am sure we are not alone in the universe. End quote. Oh boy. <laughs> well, there's a hole in the story. On the surface, Solovyov's comments and I apologize for totally mutilating these names, seem to put to rest this controversy once and for all. But things are rarely as clear-cut as that. To begin with, there were five additional eyewitnesses. There is also the fact that following his career as a cosmonaut, Solovyov became the mere flight director before temporarily retiring on February 18, 1994, only to return to lead the Russian section of the International Space Station. One has to ask the serious question of whether or not a man of Solovyov's position would be sabotaging his own career and reputation by confirming such a bizarre event. The answer, of course, is that the mass media would become extremely derisive toward anyone claiming to have had an encounter with massive space angels. 
and a man of Solovyov's stature could ill afford to be made a fool of. So, you know, I know it's me grasping at straws a little bit, but you can't help but think, where's the line between part of me just wants to, you know, just say, oh, he said it's bullshit. It's bullshit wrapped up case closed. But then there's another part of me that like what I speculated there, like there's a lot to lose by being honest with something like this. And I don't want to fall into like a Michael Shermer hole of every time there is an out that allows me to ignore anything that goes beyond Newtonian based reality, fucking I will take it and I won't open my mind. So that's why, even though he said that, and you know, for most people that's case closed for me, it's like, yeah, but there's still five other people I haven't heard from. And the fuck you, you know, I don't blame you if you don't want to fucking concede to it, but there, I mean, if, if two more or even one more came out, then I'd start being like, ah, all right. But at this point, I can see why dude wouldn't want to concede to this. Yeah. Or, you know, we, we could be dealing with some sort of misinformation campaign. In what way? Uh, as far as whatever was reported that they saw, if it was in, if it was planted by the U S or if it was planted by another, uh, nation state that was, uh, you know, not wanting the, you know, trying to, di- to knock the Russians down a little bit by like, Oh yeah, look, they've got their astronauts over here seeing these seven angels and God's bowl of Ponderosa over here, <laughs> just putting it out there, just putting it out there that. So wait, are you confirming the capitalist space angel hologram project? <laughs> I honestly have been kind of leaning that way that maybe that the U S was like fucking with them in a way to be like, yeah, let's just screw with them or let's just plant these stories. Cause I mean, come on, consider the time, consider the era, consider what our government and other governments were doing. It's not really hard to plant this type of shit. No, I mean, absolutely nowadays not. with Twitter, it's much easier, but back then, oh, yeah, no, we live a in a den of lies now. Like, yeah. Exactly. It's just a matter of putting a couple of things out, and the next thing you know, you don't even know what the hell the real story is. You're absolutely and, and, right. And back then, it would be so much easier because there is not really a way to fact check all these. You can't call the Kremlin and be like, "What did your people see?" They're not going to give you shit. So if this guy's coming out and saying, "You know, I didn't see anything," but maybe this story was planted by the U.S. or, like I said, some other you know nation state. Um, then, you know, you never know. No, you're right. I mean, an agent of the CIA or the NSA or whatever the, you know, MI6 could have planted a article in a a French newspaper that gets picked up by the AIP wire and it gets published in the Washington post and and in the parade of all things, that little weird Sunday supplemental that used to come in the comics. Oh yeah. The parade. parade, Yeah. So you're right. It is possible to do that. And, and maybe you do that. Um, because, Oh, they stuck it to you. They got, you know, Svetlana got to do this first space just, walk and Kathleen D gets fucking stuck, you know, in the fucking being the second best. And so fuck right. you, you saw an angel, but I still don't right. understand really what you'd have to gain from that. And you're I just, would, you're discrediting them. You're right. You're no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I get that you make them look kind of foolish or whatever, but I would still like to hear from the others to know for sure. Yeah, no, like me, I'm not a true believer. What I'm trying to do, I guess right now is play devil's advocate and, uh, and you know, all right, let's finish this up and then we'll get to that shit. While hundreds of notable historical events captured headlines during the penultimate act of the cold war, the strange sightings hailing from the Salyut seven barely made a ripple in the vast sea of information that the media reported regarding U S Soviet relations in the 1980s. And when they did so, they would come hot on the heels of a momentous event in the record of manned astronautics, Svetskaya's spacewalk. So like we were talking, maybe it was something to undermine that. Although rumor has it that their sighting was immediately classified as a state secret, the tale of the cosmonauts run in with these strange space seraphim did eventually make the international news. Eventually, in the decades that have followed the initial event, this account has taken a life of its own and has continued to spread with dogged persistence. Is that due to the fact that the truth has a way of lingering even in the face of conventional logic and fanatical skeptics? Or is it the human fascination with the unknown, particularly the idea of divine intervention, that keeps this legend alive? In the end, the only people who will ever know the whole story of what took place in orbit around the Salyut 7 that July day in 1984 
are the men and women who were aboard the vessel. While there's a chance that this whole story is nothing more than wildly exaggerated hearsay, there's also a minute possibility that celestial beings showed themselves to a group of humans who represented a nation that was among the most dangerous of the 20th century. Mayhap, this was an effort to get the USSR to change its ways. Or perhaps the arrival of these entities indicates that it's already too late. Oh, there it is. Space angels or misinformation. Take your pick. Ponderosa, RIP. Oh, I know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the entire time that we've been going over the story, what kept sticking in my mind was quite possibly this whole misinformation campaign, especially, Absolutely. like I said, given the time and place and in, in, in the tensions, it's not unheard of for people to plant unfounded stories. I mean, Christ, Hunter S. Thompson did it to uh, there was a politician and he said he was an Ibogaine. And then I can't remember the entire story. Damn it. My mind's flaking, but it's not. Yeah, unheard. besides it's fear not, and loathing in Vegas and the campaign trail, I know very little about Hunter Town. Yeah, this is part of the whole campaign trail thing. So, but it's not, especially back then, man. There was no Wikipedia. There was no fact checking. Not that today is. The, oh yeah, it's, it's not a shit in, show today. Like at we're least, not no, in the age of truth. No, here, but, here's the I thing. Mean, it's you know. No, let me let me play devil's advocate. Like Washington Post is a not fucking around paper. Now you got to remember, like eighty four is barely a decade past the Watergate scandal. And they were the people that basically fucking, you know, they sank a presidency, a corrupt presidency. Absolutely. But they did it. So they're the kinds of people that aren't going to fucking print something unless it is at least somewhat vetted. Now, I don't know. This wasn't just like a weird wire story that they just threw on page 37. And it's just like, Hey, you know, space angels, whatever. But on the other hand, um, you know, at least some modicum of, uh, of vetting must have gone into this. I don't think they went, you know, went up to, you know, the fucking Cosmodrome and fucking tried to innervate, innervate, Jesus Christ, interview the fucking <laughs> premier of fucking Russia. But, uh, right. but I think they probably looked into it. And here's another weird thing that you hear time and time again from dedicated ufologists. And that is a lot of times the greatest headlines of the most truthful scenarios, even though they're exploited in the most abhorrent ways are the shit you find on tabloids in your supermarket checkout line, be it the weekly world news or the national Enquirer or whatever. A lot of times the truth is there masked with like a horrible Photoshop of Hillary Clinton holding her alien baby or whatever the fuck it might be. And, and, and still like the one story that's got a core of truth, but it's right. caught in this miasma of deceit and bullshit and uh, the the assumption that only people of very low IQ would even bother to glance at it more than cursorily while they're fucking in the checkout line. So if Washington Post puts it out, it doesn't mean it's fucking fact by any stretch of the imagination. But at least it's kind of intriguing that it was there. And again, I would like to know what Svetlana thought, what Igor thought, what fucking Vladimir thought, you know, I, I'm, you know, the one guy was like, I'm at, you know, I'm at a fucking junior high school in England. I'm the fucking head of the, you know, the, I, the Mir space station. I'm the head of the fucking Russian space program. Someone's like, did you really see a space? And it was like, why would the Washington post in my greatest, you know, Russian accent do something like that? It is absurd. It's silly pants. (laughs) They should go home, wear a clown hat, and be ashamed of themselves. You know, I mean, I can, it wouldn't be (laughs) excellent Russian accent, by the way. Russian accent. I know. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah. Oh, my God. I should be in the WWF. You're a director. I just want you to know that. (laughs) I mean, you're not an actor. You're not an actor. You're clearly a director. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. No, I, again, I can definitely, I totally see both sides of the story here. Look, I want to believe that these Russians all saw these giant angelic Titan, like fucking seven beings with their wrath of God bowls and their trumpets. And their, right, they like, didn't smiling, have trumpets like, or bowls. Let's, let's call the, they're truth. implied okay. they're behind their backs. They're hidden in the wings. Like they're like, we gotcha. I think ha, this might be the first gotcha. time this conversations ever happened in the English language. And that is the bowls were implied. <laughs> 
<laughs> the polls were implied. They're, but please they're, continue. They're, they're keeping them hidden. I really want to believe that that happened. So you've got the one guy saying that nothing else happened, and then you have nobody else really that coming I know out of. and talking. In about. all fairness, yes, I mean that, they all might have gone on the record. Of. Yes. So we have hearsay of these people. You know, you had the, the first flight and then the second flight, possibly seeing something. Again, I'm I don't know why I'm going so skeptic on this as far as like either it's misinformation or maybe it's it, it is the capitalistic hologram trying to destroy the atheistic uh communist uh cabal of space uh astronauts, right? That's cosmonauts, thing. but yeah. yes, no, space astronauts. Cosmonauts. Yeah. Space astronauts I'll tell you, I'll as tell you opposed why to you land that. astronauts. You loathe it the same reason I get skeptical of things. When things seem to be a pro um, theocratic, I won't even say theological, right. just hyper, it's a power, you know, it's a power system that, you know, I know I worked a long time to get out from under and uh, I know you've, you know, it's, it's part of the punk rock DNA. You're like, oh, it's part of the patriarchy. It's part of the bullshit that's been used to oppress the masses literally since the crusades, if not, well, definitely before. And so, Anything that seems to be like, oh, it's just an angel. It's not like a quaint little story that might make some people happy. For people like us, right. we put our extra hardcore skeptic hat on. And I fucking completely dig that. So let's just acknowledge completely. There's a huge chance that this is a hoax. There's also a very serious chance that, that um, it was some agency of the United States trying to make fools of people that had just uh, outmaneuvered them, outmanned them, outwoman them specifically. And, and that could be all valid and we totally entertain that possibility so let's put that aside and assuming that the scientists and cosmonauts saw what they thought they saw or at least truly believe that's what they saw let's discuss what the possibilities of that are so uh, again they're surviving in the vacuum these these giant titans are surviving in the vacuum of space uh, you know, they're apparently they had they don't give they give zero fucks about pressure and or oxygen, so they're just up there. So if these are some weird, I don't know, celestial beings just that are out there, apparently in our in our solar system, just doing doing their deal. Doing I mean, yeah, I you know that's a thing that we have to figure out. I well, mean, here, that's, here, maybe we can address that. I let me address this at some part. point. Um, I'm not worried about the fact that they are in the vacuum of space without, you know, breathing apparatuses and cosmic ray fucking shielding and whatever else, because if they exist, then they are something either beyond they're either transitional right. interdimensional things that are like, uh, you know, showing themselves, but are somewhere else or they're, or maybe truly, you know, to give the devil, or in this case, you know, the God, it's his due. Um, divine beings that are not in the least bit limited by physical parameters like a lack of oxygen or or the you know right. the terrible frigid vacuum so yeah I, angels wouldn't care about that kind they of stuff they wouldn't give like a yeah fuck. this is our this is our shit and this is what we do you know we just exist and we are and here we here you know they follow god or they me. don't um they yeah. they pork the sons of man and make giants i mean there's literally like five or six things we know angels fucking do they have bulls they're full of fucking yeah. loathsome sores, you know, but there's dude a fucking angel trumpet, dude, the, the, the angel of ska band. Oh my God. Yeah. You, that's the first thing I thought. And you know what the other <laughs> thing, <I> think, <laughs> let's go back to grinning Doomsday. men with their black and white checkered shirts. Come on. That's ska as fuck. Oh, the grinning men it's and the apocalyptic sweet, yeah. angels would be a horrible long name for a ska band, but I could totally see that theme working. They were the brass section for Mephiscopheles. Oh, exactly. there it is. There it so is. these things. Uh, don't need to have limitations. So I don't give a fuck about that. I am impressed with their 80 foot stature though. Again, that could be just how they're showing up. So here's, here's something let's take it from a, a straight up theological point of view, how uh, maybe one of the nuns might've taught this to me when I was literally in parochial school back in uh, 85. And that is um, these beatific beings of light and goodness were sent by God to show themselves in all of their massive glory. And they made themselves large to really um, send home the fact that they are epic and so full of love and so all encompassing that they are literally beyond the scale. And they smile kindly at you to let you know that we are real. 
despite the fact that you are by law atheists, even though I know a lot of Russians, you know, worshipped in their own way privately. And and I am here to let you know, you esteemed members of the Communist Party, you revered heroes of an entire nation who have the ear of both the people and the and and the pol- and the you know the Politburo fucking that we're here, we're real, and this is not the time to fuck up everything. That is the theological perspective okay, I would yeah, think yeah. would be presented it to is. us. Okay. And you could extrapolate from that, though I think it is a fucking stretch, that because we weren't burnt to a fucking, you know, a cinder, that maybe it worked. But there is other, other. I mean, uh, the logical way of thinking about it is nobody really wants to commit suicide. It's it's ridiculous. And and if you don't have a truly homicidal leader and then his acolytes or her, but mostly his in this world, fucking uh, aren't ready to follow it, most people wouldn't let you destroy the world just because you fucking want to. That's the rational way. The, I guess, more divine way would be thinking, Maybe little things like this uh, encouraged people not to go too far. And of course, there's the entire, just the straight scientifically ufological perspective, which is like, you know, like we mentioned earlier in this article, like where Minutemen missiles were either shut down on mass things that weren't connected, but just weren't allowed to go on. Or in Russia, where they were all set to go off and at the last minute it was stopped, where aliens are basically showing you, oh, we control this shit. You don't get to fucking ruin this planet. You guys, you fucking hairless ape fuck-alls. We want the best for you. We want you to fucking rise up, pull yourself up by your britches, you know, fucking pull a full-on Stephen Greer and meditate your way into our hearts. But if you aren't going to do that, we're not going to let you fucking turn this place into a fucking fallout hole of shit and radiation. You know, Mad Max is cool on the movie screen. You don't get to live it. Eat it. Yeah. Um, conversely though, to be fair, they didn't do anything. They were just there. They had a smile, they saw them and then they, they disappeared. Right. So maybe it's just the act of showing up, you know, being big man on campus, showing up and being like, oh, you guys think you're cool because you got up here. Well, guess what? We've been here all along. We don't care about pressure. We don't need your, your, your feudal oxygen. And, uh, yeah, here we are. There's seven of us. Oh, think about that. You little atheist. What are you going to do with that? too. Twice. Allegedly. Yeah, twice. And they had Seven a smile, twice. a smirk. That's it. A smile and a smirk. No message. No. There was no message. There was no no transmission. There was no interaction. Just just seeing them. You almost so, wish there was a message. Like all the people that have Marian apparitions, you know, be it Fatima or Lords, they always seem to be um given a whole list and agenda of things like stop the world. Oh, war, not these guys. <laughs> don't touch yourself like that. You'll go blind. Whatever, whatever oh, the messages yeah. are, there's like, yep. I know they were sealed. Like the, especially in the, the Fatima one, like two were revealed. And then the third was whatever. And it was allegedly revealed somewhat recently, but like you would, but then again, that's the problem I have with ET contact stuff. It's like a lot of times either they're giving misleading information or, or nothing at all. It's like, figure it out for yourself. Well, we're fucking idiots. Can you just tell us? Half the people aren't going to believe it anyway, but if you could fucking just say what you mean, then at least some of us are going to get it because we're not all that bright. I mean, we're engineering yeah. junkies. We do some gonna... awesome shit. We make a good music video <clears throat> circa 83, right. but we're not fucking, we're not all that bright. Help, help if a motherfucker gonna... out. If... If you got a message, be clear about yes! it. If anything, if anything, be clear. <laughs> Just all you got to do. I think everybody listening to this podcast, consider this for one second. No matter what you're doing in your life, communicating with people, always be, be clear. clear. You're, be clear. And everything is so much you, easier. Mark Stores. It's the best go. piece of advice I think you could get. Don't mince be words. Clear. Don't be passive aggressive. Don't be, be fucking clear. around. And there's nothing I hate more than when people get um, pissy with me because I didn't read their fucking minds and understand by implication exactly what they wanted. <laughs> are you are are you referencing me <laughs> sending you the link for this episode no. and then assuming that you're going to answer the <laughs> click the link? <laughs> All right, fair enough. But no, this was not classic for you. Ah, <laughs> gotcha. This it's probably um, um other friends and maybe and maybe three ex-girlfriends. <laughs> 
And oh, I'm not indicting no. a gender in this. I'm oh, not indicting God. anybody. All I right. swear I'm not. What I'm saying is, don't assume I'm fucking psychic. I'm I'm bright, but I'm dumb enough not to know what you're thinking. If you want something and you tell me, I will do my damnedest if I care about you to come through. If you don't, don't assume I can read between the lines and understand the subtext and then get mad at me later. There it is. Be clear. We've got the the Salyut 7 Space Angels, aliens or apocalyptic apparitions. Could be misinformation. Lies, could, be angels, yeah. could be harbingers of doom. We don't know. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Hellerspace.com. Get yourself some T-shirts. If you order T-shirts from us and they are not correct, if there's a printing error, things look weird. Let us know. Contact me. Please. I will help you out. And by us, Patreon. I need Patreon. Yes. Yes, contact me. I will take care of it. I will immediately have an instant anxiety attack, and <laughs> I'll go to a complete panic attack. And I'll, but don't worry. Yeah, you I will always do. But you always you. take care of things. I do not know why you put yourself through that fucking hell. I, because if someone's going to order shit from us and it comes fucked up, I feel personally responsible. Of course, even but though it'll I, get, I it'll have get nothing fixed. to do with it. But still, I have to. I take personal responsibility for it because they are spending their hard earned money on things that we put out there, and it bugs me. Just like when the post office loses a goddamn tube oh, it makes me mad. and it doesn't show oh, up. It makes and me then mad. There's a whole thing, though. It did show up. It was weird. Okay. It was a weird synchronicity. We'll talk about that in a Patreon episode. Anyway, uh, patreon.com slash podcast. One dollar is a shout out. Five dollars is a shout out. And the bonus audio. Both of that brings you to the Discord. And that's so it's worth been- it. Oh, totally. No, the the Discord's awesome. Our Facebook group, check that out. Uh, it's uh, the Facebook, uh, the Cryptonaut Podcast they Facebook are also fan page. fucking awesome. A joy. It is dope. It is cool. The only reason um, I go to Facebook anymore, really. Yeah, no, same, same here. I just pop in there to see what everyone's doing, so that's it. So I got my Apple Watch. I got my bidet. I got my COVID vaccine. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm just over here living the best life that I'm trying to live. It's been a long fucking month. Oh boy, um, we're boy. hoping to have Chris back soon. Yes. I talked to him this week. Uh, he's he's still kind of like can, he still has some ramifications. He's kind of like congested and stuff, and kind of coffee and gross sounding. Yeah, so. we, we 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 talked so, a lot today too, and uh, it was great. It was great to hear from him, and, and great yeah, to definitely. you know we almost had like a heart to heart tear thing. Like, dude, you can't do that shit to me anymore. Mark and I were on fucking we're we're on death yeah, watch. No. You can't do that shit. I know you. him and I had the same conversation. I started to get a little bit teary. I know like, we did too. It's like, I know. man, you got to know God you're a brother. It. You cannot. I know you cannot yeah. live like this. We're going to keep him. We, just gotta, in, you know we have to put him in a, we're going to buy him at your bolt in, in a bubble a, and we're going to yes, fucking a bubble keep of him love. safe. And of course, love bubble. there'll be access for alcohol and hugs, but not contact with other people because we need to preserve our Chris. Okay, well now we're we're cutting him off from physical contact. Well, no, I want you know I want him you know other people he he loves can have access and lovers can certainly find their way into the bubble with permission. Okay, four forms of ID and uh, proper scrutiny by us, and then they get zipped in after they get scrubbed down thoroughly with like rubbing alcohol and ammonia. I can't handle all of this administration more. I'll do it. So we're going to Dude, do, I'll keep gonna, Chris no, alive. No, you, you won't. worry about the rest. <laughs> you of it. won't do it. You know you won't oh, do it. Oh, you'd be it. surprised what I do, do to keep stop. my friends alive. People I love, right, that's fine. literally what I do best. That literally is your job. That's all I do. <laughs> oh, so, yes. Taking care of the people do. I love is literally my paramount duty. Monsters and shit, it that's is, wonderful. Yes, that indeed. shit's way second to you. Thank you all so very much for your continued support of the show. It means so much to us. It has been a fucking bizarre oh, time. I don't know how to, uh, I, don't, I, no. I can't explain it any it other way. It started with than, the Mothman. And what a weird trip. I will like, say this too, even though it's going to come out after the fact, mom's feeling better. Thank you for everyone that sent good, well, well yes. wishes and prayers. Yes, Rob's mom it's, oh my God, it was a tough, scary time. We've all been going through yeah. some tough times. Every one of us, us and our listeners but we're, you know, obviously Mark and I are trying to muddle through without Chris and we're just doing the best we can, but we're all together as a family. We're working our balls off and you know what? It is going to get better and shit is going to click. And, uh, eventually this pod's going to make sense again. I'm hoping at some point that we can just get together because mm. I fucking miss you guys so oh much. My fucking God, dude, <laughs> Not I seeing you, you guys forever. sucks. <laughs> it really, it really, you, you don't think about the small things and I get it. It's COVID, it's quarantine. We're being safety safe, first. The, yeah. The weird small things of getting together weekly with you guys, we we have been doing it even before this podcast, 
this this podcast for so many years. So many years. It's you take it for you, you take it for granted for a little bit, but then when it's taken away from you, you're like, "Fuck, man! I haven't seen these dudes face to face in fucking months." The fucking, like it sucks. The shit we talk, the laughter we share before yes. and after the microphone, and Ugh. definitely on mic, is just. It's literally. It is the spine that holds up the body of my goodwill. The shit that keeps me going. As much as I adore my family and all my other friends, I need you guys so much. And uh, and you're right. This is good. This is methadone. This will get us through the kick. Yeah. But uh, hopefully, boy, I need a proper hit of buddy yeah. love. Yeah. No. Same here. We got hugs all around. Thank you all so very much for joining us. And we're talking to you soon. Bless you, motherfuckers, one and all. <laughs>